Good morning. Good morning. Class is beginning. Uh, there'll be an exam at the end, uh, and Professor, Dr. Professor Albright will grade your papers. Um, I'm Jane Harmon, President and CEO of the Wilson Center. I do not have a PhD like Madeline. I do have a law degree, but uh, I have been uh, a friend and admirer of uh, Madeline Albright forever. Uh, and special thanks to Mike Van Dusen. Where's Mike? Oh, he's in the corner. No, he doesn't. He's not entitled to a seat. Uh, whom all of you know and love as a longtime uh, executive vice president here and before that top aide to Lee Hamilton on the Hill. Special thanks to Mike for organizing this event. Mike said a year and a half ago or so that he was retiring. Well, ha, that wasn't going to happen. And his special assignment has been to uh, create a database, no idea why it took us this long, of all 4,500 former scholars and round you up uh, for events in um, uh, some, some sad places like Rome and Paris uh, and Washington, D.C. And this is actually our first scholar event in Washington, D.C., kicked off by our former scholar, uh, Madeleine Albright. Um, uh, other scholars, just to give you kind of a flavor, not that you didn't know this, include Tom Friedman, Jeff Jeffrey Goldberg, who's coming here now, isn't here quite yet? No, coming? June. Coming in June, Nicholas Burns, Mark Grossman, and even a former president of Botswana. <laughs> you all connect the world to Washington, and you help the center connect Washington to the world. Wherever you are, uh, and many of you are in this room, I think 70 of you are here, we want to keep you involved. Uh, as I mentioned, we did a scholar event in Paris uh, earlier this week, literally this week, uh, perfect springtime weather. It was a hardship. <laughs> and we had uh, three different panels of scholars, a reception hosted by the U.S. Ambassador uh, to France, uh, and a variety of other things for a group of Wilson supporters that we call our, our Global Advisory Council. And it was absolutely spectacular. Some of the events were in the new museum in Paris, the Fondation Louis Vuitton uh, in the Bois de Boulogne. Uh, it was absolutely glorious. So if you stick with us, you'll get to go to Paris, too. Um, <laughs> Last fall, uh, U.S. Ambassador to Italy, current U.S. Ambassador, John Phillips, welcomed us to Rome. That was our largest alumni reunion yet, and uh, topics for discussion included Russia, Ukraine. We had a number of uh, former scholars from both places there, uh, among other things. And today, we're redoubling that commitment, and uh, as all of you know, we have two panels following this, plus a lunch. Um, want to give a shout out to one scholar. I don't know if she's here yet. I don't see her, but maybe she is. And that's Helene Cooper, who was here recently. I mean, on, on my watch, I've been here four years. Helene was a scholar here. Uh, she won a Pulitzer Prize this year. I don't know whether any of the rest of you did, but Helene did. I'm sorry for you, uh, for her reporting on the Ebola crisis. So uh, with the amount of talent assembled at the center today and every, you know, now and, and in years past is incredible. And it's my special pleasure to welcome back uh, a dear friend, Wilson Scholar, former Secretary of State and U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. and a variety of other things, Madeleine Albright. Uh, Madeleine and I were Senate aides together in the early 70s, uh, before some of you were born. And then we also were colleagues in the Carter White House. Uh, afterwards, I practiced law for years, and she came here with the smart idea to be a scholar, and then went on uh, after this to earn your PhD. No, the other way. Other way. Got the PhD first, came here, wrote a book she'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and uh, she produced the book here. The book you produced here was Poland, the Role of the Press in Political Change. Got that right. And if you want to read more about her time at the center, you can pick up a copy of her autobiography, Madam Secretary. Uh, one of the five New York Times bestsellers she's penned so far. <laughs> uh, her time here was one more achievement in an incredibly distinguished career. We all know what she's done. Uh, she holds a PhD from Columbia and is currently and actively teaching uh, a course at Georgetown. She'll tell you in just a moment. Uh, so we're fortunate to have her uh, 
opened this uh, first scholar conference in Washington, and the topic we're going to discuss for uh, about 40 minutes, uh, half my questions and half your questions, is, is the United States still the indispensable nation? So please welcome Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. Thank you. Okay. So, Madeline. Jane, let me thank you for having me here. And uh, there's nothing better than to be introduced by a good friend. So thank you very much. And I'm really, really delighted to be here. Well, Sorry I didn't wear blue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, actually, I sort of fade and you <laughs> shine. And by the way, I asked what the pin is. Explain what the pin is. Happy sunny day. So Happy sunny day. No, <coughs> yeah. no, no hidden message. No hidden message. Uh, okay. <coughs> so th let's start with the topic, uh, is the United States, States still the indispensable nation? You coined that phrase. Many people use it. I've amended your phrase, and I want to see what you think of my amendment. I've said the United States is still the indispensable partner, my point being that there's much less we can do alone in this world and much more we can do partnering with others. Do you like my amendment to your, your uh, I, I You have made it clearer, but it was always part of what indispensable nation meant. And let me just say, President Clinton said it first. It's just that I said it so often that it became identified with me. And um, the truth is that in just starting, you know, when we said it was in 1993, um, there's no question that there's nothing in the definition of indispensable that says alone. It means that we have to be engaged. And so it always had that context of partnership and operating with others. Um, the problem is that I think that um, finding the right partners, who do you do it with? And that is the part that is getting more complicated. But there is no question in my mind that we are the indispensable nation. And the reason I say that is that I have sat around too many multilateral tables of a variety of kinds, either formal ones at the UN or informal various conferences and things that we go to. And unless the United States is engaged, I have to say, nothing happens. And I think that our problem is trying to figure out where we fit in. Or at the UN, one of the things, frankly, you know, often people think of, not in this room, but others at, at the Security Council always takes place in that fancy room. That is not where it happens. It all happens in the background. And there the question is, <clears throat> does the U.S. speak first in order to set the agenda? Do you speak last in order to do summarize? Um, or do you speak in the middle? But the bottom line is you need the others to work with you. So you have made what was kind of uh, thought by the word indispensable clearer by saying that it has to be with partners. So, Well, you could repeat that if you yeah, want. That, 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 yeah. I appreciate that. But let's just play that out in terms of uh, what's in the press today. Yesterday, uh, President uh, Obama had a meeting at Camp David with uh, the leaders of, of many of the GCC countries, except only two of them showed, and others had other representatives. Obviously, he's trying to build a partnership with the GCC and, try, and trying to generate more support for the initiative he and the P5 are taking with Iran. Uh, but that is, is that partnership effort going okay? I mean, why did some people not show? What's your assessment of how we're doing building partnerships? Uh, my sense is actually that the meeting went pretty well. Um, I think it is very hard to read other leaders' minds and uh, why they did or didn't come. There was kind of a snotty thing in the newspapers which said it's that the Camp David wasn't fancy enough uh, for them. Uh, by the way, if I were to ask any of you to go to Camp David, I think you'd probably say you'd love to. I can tell you after two weeks in the rain with the Israelis and Palestinians, <laughs> I don't care if I ever go back. Uh, <laughs> But I, I'm I do going think, there next, um, not the rain part. Uh, uh, but that basically, I do think that it went well. But it is a perfect example of uh, what you asked me initially. The United States does not want to run the Middle East. There have been questions about what happened after World War II. Who's the guarantor? Did we take the place of the British? A number of different questions. There's no que there's no question that we don't want to run it. So the question is how and who are the partners? And there is this kind of um, minuet going on at the moment, trying to figure out what the partnership means, what do they want, uh, how do you get the other countries to work with each other, uh, what are our agendas. But that is why we all know that partnerships are more complicated than going around and telling everybody what to do. 
the bottom line is that I think this was a, a good meeting in a direction that is going to be very hard in terms of yeah. how to develop functioning partnerships to, to figure out whether we have a common agenda. Well, speaking of that, and I'll change the subject after this, uh, Israel-Palestine, you mentioned it. You spent a huge amount of time on it. John Kerry spent a gigantic amount of time on it, and sort of the rap was, uh, we wanted it more than the leaders of the two countries, or one is not a country, than the leaders of Israel and the Palestinian Authority wanted it, and so it didn't make. Uh, but many think, unless that agreement comes soon, uh, Israel will no longer be a pluralist democracy and the Palestinians will find another way to get their state through the UN uh, going around us. I mean, what advice do you have uh, for uh, both, both entities and for the U.S. to try to put that deal back on the table? Well, I, I think that it is absolutely essential to get some kind of an agreement. What is often, I, I do not like it when people say that everything that's going on in the Middle East is as a result of the fact that the Israelis and the Palestinians don't have an agreement. They, that is right. not responsible for every problem, uh, you know, thousands of years of enmity between uh, Arabs and Persians and Shia and Sunni and all that. But, but I do think for its own sake it has to be resolved. Uh, I do, I happen to think that the two-state solution is the best solution. The problem here is the United States, uh, you know, we have some of the most brilliant negotiators and people that have more interesting ideas and bridging ideas and all kinds of things, but unless the political leadership of Israel and the Palestinians want to do something, it isn't going to happen. I mean, there are those who say, let's just put something down and tell them to do this. Um, we can have the ideas, but it takes that political leadership, uh, and I think that's the question at the moment. Um, the Israelis have just, I gather, put together a government. Um, it's pretty shaky. I will not comment on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then the issue is among the Palestinians, and I say among the Palestinians, because there are a variety of groupings there. And then obviously the international community is getting more involved with, it, uh, with the UN and also the Pope. So. Uh, that's right. The Pope spoke out this week right. for a Palestinian yeah. state. Um, one more Middle East question, can't resist. So yesterday, to my astonishment, the House, by a vote of 400 to 25, that would be a bipartisan vote for those of you who might have missed it. Uh, hi, Bruce. <laughs> the House uh, uh, ratified this uh, Iran proposal that Senators Corker, Cardin, and Tim Kaine put together that has passed this, the Senate and is going to the President for signature and he's going to sign it. Uh, what do you think of that proposal and what do you think of at least it's not it, it ain't over till it's over but the way we're proceeding with this p5 plus one agreement with Iran well first of all um, one of the things that I always find uh, fascinating and you spoke about the fact that you and I both worked on the hill and then went to an administration I think the most interesting part about the US uh, democratic system or executive legislative relations and in fact um, uh, what it's like on foreign policy. Uh, books have been written with the title Invitation to Struggle as to whether Article I or Article II dominates in foreign policy. There is no question that the executive branch is the one whose job it is to negotiate agreements and treaties, but treaties require uh, votes of uh, advice and consent on ratification. Agreements don't. But and so there, part of it is a constitutional issue, but I do think that this is uh, an issue that has uh, kind of aroused so many feelings that it's not bad to have Congress have, they obviously have um, control over the sanctions right. process. And so I think that it's an interesting example of a compromise uh, that should work. Uh, we don't know yet what the final agreement is right. going to be like. Uh, we do not what makes it slightly more complicated is that it is a multilateral agreement um, and whether certain things that we do then undermine what the other members of the P5 plus one want. But I think it's a good step forward. And I would just add that um, I have thought for a long time, I think many here do, that Congress has abdicated its responsibility to authorize the use of military force. It still can't agree on an AUMF resolution for what we're doing in Syria and Iraq and uh, the old stuff has long expired. I actually voted for those authorizations um, uh, four, 13 and 14 years ago. 
and they don't apply here, and Congress is AWOL. So this was, I thought, a very positive step by Congress to do something responsible. I do think, Jane, one of the things we've um, all seen on both sides is there's a lot of moaning and groaning by Congress of not being consulted and not being involved, and then when they are supposed to do no. their job, then they are AWOL on it. And so I do think this is one of those uh, moments where uh, there's an awful lot, of, oh my God, we need to be a part, and this is very legitimate, and the whole issue on War Powers Act, and so I think that um, uh, you state it correctly. Yeah, let's state it here. This is a rare success story by the United yeah. States Congress. Uh, turning to just a couple other issues, uh, Ukraine. Uh, you and I were there together, Madeline led the delegation, of course she did, for the National Democratic Institute, which she chairs, uh, and the International Republican Institute was also there uh, during the uh, first Ukraine election in May of last year. And among other things, we met with the presidential candidates, including Poroshenko and Timoshenko, and we tooled around uh, in uh, Kiev, and I also went to Odessa uh, to see how the voting was going. Uh, we met Poroshenko, who was very impressive, and who promised that his government, if elected, would respond to the uh, really courageous uh, uh, protests by these mostly young people in the Maidan uh, about corruption and government failure in his country. So, okay, it's a year later. Uh, we understand the Russians have been meddling in the East, but how do you assess Poroshenko's pro progress under these tough circumstances? Um, I think that he is <clears throat> doing the best he can. I think that <clears throat> they, they are very, very tough circumstances. I'm very worried about everything. I, I, uh, um, I used to be known as a Soviet expert, uh, and I sometimes look at my library and I thought, Ar well, archaeology. It's not archaeology. <laughs> um, and I think Putin's behavior is unacceptable, and we can spend time on that. On the other hand, I do think it's also important to deal with the Russians, so I'm glad that uh, Secretary Kerry went there, that it is possible for us to look at areas where we can cooperate. We had been talking about Iran on the P5 plus 1 uh, agreements, but that we need to be tougher in terms of what's happening in Ukraine. And uh, I am on record as saying that uh, people should be allowed to defend themselves, and I would hope that we would do what one of the things that Poroshenko asked for when he was here was to get more trainers and some equipment and to be able to um, uh, kind of professionalize their military. The other part, though, Jane, I think is that um, they have been given economic assistance, and right. people talk about the Marshall Plan, but the Marshall Plan was not just money. Marshall Plan were advisors and people that could really, there was kind of an infrastructure in terms of helping on things. They have very serious problems in Ukraine. Uh, we saw it when we were there in terms of a kind of impunity and corruption and mm -hmm. side deals, political deals, et cetera, that were made. It's a very large country. You know, I, I always like it when um, in American newspapers something's compared today. They said Macedonia is the size of Vermont. Well, Ukraine is huge, and it is right. one of the largest countries in Europe, and you can't just kind of say, okay, let's just let it worry about itself. And whatever messages that we're giving on Ukraine are being absorbed in the Baltics. Um, and so what Putin did was something that broke every post-World War II norm, and I think that we have to make clear that we need to assist Ukraine. Well, I, one of the uh, suggestions you made there, and I think uh, Poroshenko took you up on it, was that they hire from their diaspora a lot right. of uh, younger technical advisors who were, are uh, well-trained and very competent. And I think he's tried to bring in uh, a, a, a young and, and capable group to change how government operates. He also dismissed one of the oligarchs who was right. part of his government, or at least one of his visible supporters. So. I would say both of those things are positive efforts in, in, you know, in, the, in the face of enormous negative uh, dra drift draft in, in the east part of the country. Well, there are those problems and also then there are uh, political problems. The truth of the matter is the political leaders, Yushchenko and Timoshenko, let the Orange Revolution 
uh, people down who had gone to Maidan earlier right. uh, in terms of their internal um, rivalries. And so one would hope, I mean, there isn't, Poroshenko and Yasenyuk, the prime minister, don't adore each other. And the bottom line <laughs> is that there needs to be uh, a lot of political compromise and Poroshenko needs support. Um, and so there are the problems on the east, but there are also the problems in Kyiv. Um, and the political aspect. But he has reduced the subsidies, or his government yes, has, on, on energy. Right. These are major requirements for f more significant IMF help, and it, to get outside help and still have a corrupt government makes no sense. To no. have a, a, a competent and, and far less corrupt government is the way Ukraine will be stronger. And I think everybody here thinks that a strong Ukraine, uh, economically strong Ukraine, is the, is the best uh, uh, weapon against what Putin is doing. Absolutely. Okay, I just have, I've got five more minutes. Um, NATO expansion, your own history is as a refugee from uh, what was then Czechoslovakia. And I remember, because I was in Congress in the 90s, that you were the strongest voice for NATO expansion. Uh, a guy named uh, George Kennan, who, uh, whose family named our Russia Institute here, the Kenna, Kennan Institute, uh, and some others like him thought NATO expansion was a bad idea at the time. Uh, looking back on it and looking at it now, uh, how, do you, how do you assess it? I hate to say that George Kennan was wrong. He was wrong. Um, and <clears throat> I think that the issue is the following, and it's going to take me a minute to explain this. Um, we have just uh, commemorated the 70th anniversary of World War II. And um, I, uh, I was a little girl at the time, and um, what was interesting was that the American troops had gotten as far as Plzeň inside Czechoslovakia, were prepared to liberate that country, uh, when as a result of agreements made during World War II, the Soviet, the Red Army, was allowed to liberate uh, all of Eastern Europe. And then what happened was the Iron Curtain came down and for 50 years people were behind it. And uh, all of a sudden the Cold War ended, and I think that um, the issue was how do you deal with complete changing in terms of which countries were where, who wanted to do what, was what was going to be the role of Russia uh, when the Soviet Union disintegrated. And the idea was that, um, and it was the first President Bush who said this, he wanted to see a Europe whole and free. Mm. He was the one that had a lot to do with the reunification of Germany um, and uh, negotiated all that. And there, it was a process. Uh, the thought was that Europe had been artificially divided and that countries should have the right to do, to choose with whom they wanted to be. And initially, the Clinton administration had started uh, with a partnership for peace, which was to try to have uh, countries join in terms of, uh, I went around with General Shali Kashvili, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs at the time, to kind of say that um, NATO is not a uh, kind of charitable operation. You have to support it. You have to be ready to be a part of it. It was the most powerful military alliance is in the history of the world. And one had to be willing to contribute to it. Uh, and <coughs> there were countries that thought that NATO thought was ready to join. I personally went to talk to Yeltsin about this, and I said, this is not against you. Uh, and at some point, you can become members right. if you want to be. The problem that we're having has nothing to do with the expansion of NATO. The problem that we're having is the fact that the Russians are going through an identity crisis. And what happened was in 1991, after I'd finished here, um, I had gone uh, to, um, um, I was teaching at Georgetown at the time and then also heading the Center for National Policy. And uh, was, did a survey across all of Europe and had focus groups and all kinds of things with Andy Kohut, whom I think a lot of people know now. Um, and I will never forget a focus group that we had outside of Moscow. And this man stands up and says, I'm so embarrassed. We used to be a superpower and now we're Bangladesh with missiles. And so what has happened is the and Russians- this is about Russia. About so Russia. Not us. No. And so <laughs> what they, no, because, uh, <laughs> uh, but- was, You left it unclear. That uh, <laughs> English is not my native tongue. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. so uh, but I think- She does pretty darn well, doesn't <laughs> uh, she? <laughs> but I really do think that the, the question is then, 
Putin has plugged into that identity crisis. And he, I think, needs enemies. And so he has decided that NATO and all the things that are not really his enemies are. But I think that NATO expansion was the right thing to do. I think the problem now is how NATO operates, whether people actually pay what they're supposed to. And it goes back to the initial question is we need partners, and NATO partners have to uh, pony up and really be part of it. Well, I'm remembering in recent years you headed a task force, did you not, on uh, sort of a, a, a refreshed look at NATO yeah. and the roles of NATO? What did you recommend? Well, let me just say what is interesting, and this is something that I am talking about more and more. I think we generally have to question our assumptions about everything, you know, because we are, I think, in one of the most uh, fluid, chaotic periods. Uh, you and I were trying to figure out what the best word for what's going on now. I just say flat out, the world is a mess, uh, which is a diplomatic term of art. Uh, but what had happened was we were celebrating Translated from Czech. the uh, 60th anniversary of NATO, and the new Secretary General Rasmussen had been named. Mm -hmm. And um, the heads of state, when they were meeting in Strasbourg, Kiel, decided that there ought to be a group of experts to advise the new Secretary General. So each country named an expert, and I was named by the U.S. And then Rasmussen decided to make the group of experts 12 automatically irritating 16 countries, <laughs> and then asked me to chair it. But the issue was, and this is where the assumptions, we thought that what we needed to be looking at more and more were out of area uh, mandates for NATO. Because who thought that there was going to all of a sudden be any military action in Europe, and that there would be a threat to NATO countries like the Baltics. And so our assessment of it was that NATO was alive and well, that it actually had more partners and it had members, uh, because there are an awful lot of countries and the Mediterranean Initiative and various aspects can work together. But in many ways, uh, we were not focused on the fact that there could be military action in Europe, which leads me to think that we definitely, and especially groups of people such as are in this audience and are very knowledgeable, we have to question our assumptions more. We thought Russia could be a normal country at the end of the Cold War. We thought that the Middle East, that there were ways that it would end up differently. Uh, there are numbers of things we have been thinking, and I more and more in my outside world keep pressing now on we have to question our assumptions more. Well, just a, an observation, Tomas Ilves, uh, who is the president of Estonia, was here a couple of weeks ago talking about uh, cyber threats to his country. From where? Russia. Yeah. I mean, who would have thought? Um, I and have by the way, if I can comment, one of the things that we were talking about in that particular strategic concept was whether a cyber attack was an Article V attack. And at that time, people were saying, we couldn't say that because it was unclear about what the origin was <laughs> and what the response to it would be. But that was one of the questions that came up that we weren't quite prepared to deal with that now needs to be dealt with. Right. Uh, final thing, I told you I would ask you this. Uh, you're coming up with a new course at Georgetown. Uh, and you're working on the curriculum now. Madeline's a great teacher at Georgetown. Has anyone taken her course here? Well, what's wrong no, with all of you? Good no. grief. I haven't either, though, but maybe. Uh, could you just describe that course and what you're going well, to try to um, I, I have been teaching it, and I love teaching ah. it, because what I did was, um, it's a made-up course, and I say foreign policy is just trying to get some country to do what you want. So what are the tools? And out of my own experience in the government, here we are, the most powerful country in the world, and there's not a lot in the toolbox. Um, and the toolbox has in it diplomacy, bilateral and multilateral. Uh, then it has the economic tools, the carrots, trade, and aid. Um, and it's a perfect, I mean, uh, TPP is a perfect example right. of trade as a tool to try to get environmental standards and labor standards, et cetera. Then, and the sticks, the sanctions, which we're seeing on Iran and uh, Russia. Then there is the threat of the use of force, the use of force, intelligence, and law enforcement. That's it. So what I do is... Um, and we were discussing culture as a... Right, and which I think tool. is... You know, um, and I think that basically uh, we look at the various tools, and then we do a role play. And the role play we just did was cyber attacks in Estonia. <laughs> Um, and then also another aspect, which is that the Russians 
all of a sudden decided to exercise. The, I am the deus ex machina of this game, so I just, whenever the students get anywhere, I screw it up. But uh, <laughs> basically, <laughs> that um, the Russians <coughs> used the concept of responsibility to protect to go into Latvia to protect their Russian population. So right. um, anyway, the course, we have a lot of fun. I teach graduates in the fall and undergrads in the spring. But the toolbox, I think, is an interesting concept in that you think that they're immeasurable tools and then how the tools interact with each other. So. Great. Well, I've just spotted Helene. Hi, Helene. Did you hear my shout out? Were you here? Oh, yeah. I gave you a shout out for your Pulitzer. Thank you. All right. Uh, audience questions, <coughs> microphones, please wait for the microphone. Identify yourself and ask a question. Don't give a speech, please. Uh, third row, red shirt. And if you're a scholar, uh, you get raise two hands, so I'm going to call on the scholars. I think that mic is not on. I don't understand why we... They never are. They, yeah. <laughs> is there some rule that mics are never on? Uh, my yeah. name is Bruce Parrott. I Still not on. Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International there Studies. Okay. Uh, and I was a, a fellow here, or a scholar, in 2011. Uh, my question has to do with the role of scholarship and scholarly research in American foreign relations. How would you appraise the contributions of scholarship to past American foreign policy? And what kind of contribution do you think it is making and should make? Um, I'm very glad you asked that, because this is one of my pet rocks. Is um, I think there is an incredible amount of scholarship that is out there that is not properly integrated into policy making. And part of it is that there's a completely different language going on. I have been both in the government and in academia. And my perfect example of something that happened Actually, this was during the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, when um, we, I was in the Carter White House at the time, tried to bring a number of scholars in to try to explain you know, what was going on, what were the history, what was well, generally, and also to try to uh, explain what the uh, Soviet Union was up to. And it was like this. The scholars were talking on one level, and the, uh, uh, you know, the practitioners were doing something else. I then found, because I keep going back and forth, when I went to ba I started teaching at Georgetown in the 80s, and again, you could see a, a disconnect. When I was in the government, because I loved academics, what I used to do was to try to have, I called them no-fault dinners, where I brought academics in, and the no-fault had nothing to do with what academics might say, but I didn't want people to interpret according to what questions I was asking, what direction we were going in. Because in the government, you just read each other's memos. Nobody even reads foreign affairs articles. I mean, you're just reading each other. And so there needs to be my, I have an endowed chair in the practice of diplomacy now, in an attempt to try to bring this together, which is this course that I just described tries to do. But there is not enough of it. And I think part of it is a disconnect. I do think sometimes, I hate to say this because I took an awful lot of theory courses, it doesn't work. Um, and I think that there need to be kind of more connection in terms of what is needed. I also do know that, and I, I'm so glad you asked this, there needs to be more in a connection <coughs> between think tanks and what is going on on the Hill. Not at hearings, which I call yellings, uh, but at, at, at various ways in the background where there can be some exchange of information. We are lacking because there is a ton of good research going on and it doesn't get into the system because of the, maybe the language or um, whatever, pretentiousness well, or whatever. But it's also the paradigm of Congress is broken. It's, yeah. you know, people blame the other side for not solving yeah. the problem and don't work together. Yeah. But just so you know, Madeline, we have foreign policy school here on Friday afternoons, and we have Hill staff come down it's here to interact <laughs> with our scholars yeah. and others and learn uh, free from spin, or as free from spin as we can make it, uh, some of the tough subjects. And guess what? We have a class of 52 here now over six weeks. Uh, they came here. One person knew three people in the room. Uh, and this is bipartisan, bicameral. They don't even know each other. Now that we're mixing it up, uh, they love this. We're on our fifth semester. And if we can't get the members down no, here, and we great. actually get members down here, but we're getting all their staff, including chiefs of staff. 
Um, let's take three questions together because I want to get around the room. Remember, if you're a scholar, raise two hands because I'm going to call on you first. Right in the middle with the red tie. And then, let's see, where's another scholar? Right over here, that's two. And where's another scholar? Right there, you're three. Okay. I will call on the rest of you, but sorry, if you haven't had the Wilson experience, you haven't had the Wilson experience. My name is uh, <coughs> Herbert Weiss. I'm a emeritus professor at City University of New York and an alumnus of this institution. Uh, returning to the Middle East, uh, we have friends who are not really friends. We, are en we have enemies who maybe actually would prefer to be friends. I'm wondering whether this whole notion of allies and enemies in, as it applies to the Middle East, is not basically uh, wrong thinking. And I'm wondering whether we would not do better following, in effect, sort of a British policy of the 19th century of balance of power. Uh, they have their problems. They don't concern us, really. But we are interested in them not spilling over to Europe and the United States. If there were a balance of power which we would be in a position to encourage, it would involve far less involvement by the United States. And on the other hand, it would keep them busy with each other. Thank you. Over here, we had, uh, who who's right there? You, second row. Hi, I'm Jack Goldstone. I'm oh, an order Jack. scholar. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. Um, next year, I'm moving to China, and I want to ask you about China. Um, will it be a normal country? And in the meantime, what's the right defense strategy? Do we extend NATO and upgrade our partnerships there to something like member status with places like Australia or Japan? Do we try and create a leave NATO in Europe and have a separate multilateral Pacific alliance? Or do we continue to go with the existing maze of bilateral alliances? Or do we do nothing that might offend China for fear of making things worse? Just curious what options you think would be best. Okay, and third, right here. Don Cloud, uh, Air Force fellow here at the Wilson Center. Uh, my question pertains to cyber. Um, last, uh, actually this month, uh, no, last month, the uh, US, or Russia and the China signed a cyber pact amongst many other pacts that they, or agreements that they signed in regards to uh, non-aggression uh, non agreement of some sorts and also trying to shape international norms. Um, of course, President Obama announced his uh, new executive order bat last month in regards to adding sanctions to the cyber toolbox in regards to U.S. response capability. Of course, we sanctioned North Korea for the uh, Sony attack, or the attack against Sony pictures. Um, in January or February, the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, made an update to its proposed International Code of Conduct for Cyberspace. And then, of course, uh, last year, the U.S. sanctioned, or not sanctioned, indicted five PLA officers uh, for industrial espionage. And so my question is, beyond just pushing and promoting what we think the U.S., what the U.S. thinks uh, international norms for cyberspace should be, uh, what else should the United States doing in addition to this to try to uh, make cyberspace a, yeah. a safer place? Are, right. Aren't our scholars smart? Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> so let me, I will um, answer all three of these parts, but there is a common theme that I think we need to think about, and that is that all these questions are um, asked within a scheme where we are acting as if the international system is the same as it has been. It is not. Um, and so part of the issue is how do you, again, to go back on my assumptions question, how do you deal with uh, different kinds of threats and the lack of leverage that the current tools have. This is the problem with my course. My course is based on the fact that there are nation states and that the tools, in fact, um, are leverage against uh, behavior because theoretically the head of a country cares about the size of the territory, various threats. We are operating in a world now where the nation state continues, but there are a whole bunch of other factors. And this goes to the balance of power question in the Middle East. I pretty feel pretty good about keeping up with day-to-day -day events. I can tell you, you almost have to sit down after reading the papers in the morning to try to figure out who is on whose side today. 
uh, what group is on whose side. Uh, you know, do the Houthis get their money today from this? Where are the Iranians with us? Where are they against us? All this. And so I think the balance of power worked in the 19th century primarily because there were not these non-state actors. Um, and, uh, and balance of power, I think, works on certain aspects but would not take care of some of the problems that are there. I think one of the issues that is there is do we give a damn at all about what's going on in the Middle East? Because uh, one of the aspects um, that goes on is, you know, why should American people care about a bunch of people in faraway places with unpronounceable names, as Neville Chamberlain said? Um, and so, not that I have a view on this subject. Uh, but, but basically, <laughs> I, and I was up on the hill the other day and was asked the question, why should we care about the Middle East except for terrorism in Israel? And I said, well, those are pretty big excepts. Um, and so the they question- They oil? No, they, but, but I, because I think that is not an issue at the moment. Right. But, but I think the bottom line is that, in fact, I don't know what works because we don't know what to do about the non-state actors. But balance of power is not going to work when you're dealing with, with various groupings. I think that's part of it. Um, I think also, and I'll get to China in a minute, but on cyber also, I think brand new tool that we don't quite know how to get at and whether, um, I mean, theoretically the Chinese government controls the PLA, but the bottom line is, you know, who is really, a, who are the hackers, who are doing things, um, who are the non-state actors in that, what are the methodologies they're using, um, and I think that there really is a question about uh, there's a new cyber um, strategy that Ash Carter just put out, and the, govern the U.S. government is trying to deal with it, not just on cyber, uh, mil, gut, dot mil and dot gov, but also dot com and various parts of it, and trying to sort that out. But it is a new weapon in a system that is not organized. And then to China, particularly, I think, uh, and many of you are much better historians than I am, and I think that what is interesting as I look at China, we are truly linked, and I don't know whether this has ever happened historically, where it is to our advantage that our rival does well, uh, yeah. because we need them economically, and, the, and we are really involved with each other. And I don't think the Germans and the Brits had that particular, maybe sometime early, but I, I'd be fascinated if this has ever happened in history before. I think we are trying to figure out what our relationship with China is. I think it's the most important relationship of the 21st century. I think uh, the tool that is being operated now is TPP to try to figure out whether if we do our part and they're doing their uh, various activities on trade, whether ultimately that can come together and then that can become kind of a model for cooperation. Part of the issue that I find interesting about what's going on um, in North and Southeast Asia is that we are, our allies don't like each other. And so what you've got are the South Koreans that are completely anti-Japanese. Uh, and we are very uh, strongest alliance with the Japanese and trying to figure out. Uh, so the other day, just showing my age, I went to college sometime between the invention of the iPad and the discovery of fire. And so uh, <laughs> I, I, I started, we were talking about the Middle East, and I said, well, whatever happened yeah. to Sento? So my question is, whatever happened to CETO? Because um, ah. we learned all that alphabet soup. And the question, and there's never been kind of a, a, um, a security infrastructure for Asia and whether we should be looking at that. There are various aspects of it that are going on with drilling and parts, but it is all in the making of it. Which brings me back to the original point is, on cyber, I think we need to go back and look at arms control agreements try to figure out what lessons come out of that and whether there is some kind of a multilateral way to approach it. Um, and on all these issues, whether there is a way to make some confidence in international institutions work because, and it goes back to your original point, Jane, which is that the U.S. needs to be engaged in partnerships, but the U.N. does not function well enough to make that happen. So. Um, we have a minute and a half, and I'm going to take uh, you in the, in the back with two hands raised, and you in the front with two hands raised, and the fellow in, where, where were you? In the blue shirt, oh, right over there. And that's it. Quick questions. Hi. Uh, Lightning round here. Quick one. Uh, 
I came to as a scholar here from international financial institution, and those are one of the that's one of the tools in the toolbox for this expanded international uh, participation. What it seems like with the Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank and then some other issues more down in the weeds, the United States has not been able to project the leadership uh, in the international financial institutions and in that community generally that we were able to in the Clinton administration. Uh, why is that and what can we do to get a little more focus there? Thank you. And then in front here, Mike, thank you. Um, I'm Henri Barkey. I'm professor still at Lehigh University, ah. soon to join the Wilson Center. Soon to Center. join the Wilson Center as head Henri. of our Middle East yes. program. Welcome, Henri. Uh, thank you. Um, Madam Secretary, you spent an enormous amount of time on Iraq when you were uh, Secretary of State. Things, to put it mildly, have not gotten better since you left <laughs> office. And it seems to me that Iraq is still the central uh, critical question in, in the Middle East today. If you can't fix Iraq, we can't fix the rest of the Middle East, probably. So what would you do? <laughs> yeah, in, in 20 seconds or less, and in the back in the blue shirt, in the middle back, right here. Yeah. Hi, Pei Xu from Voice of America. Uh, talking about uh, this country b being uh, indispensable, uh, China often looms large in many people's uh, mi mind's eye. And uh, my question is, uh, how do you look at uh, the issue of this country being indispensable in the context of uh, rising China when China seems to be trying to establish uh, a competing uh, world order these days. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, except let me answer the international financial and the China together because in, in many ways they go together. I think um, that the United States screwed up um, on the Asian Infrastructure Bank, and partially that is Congress's fault mm -hmm. uh, for not having done what it needed to do on the International Monetary Fund, okay. um, and generally Great. kind of um, holding things back and uh, on the way that the IFIs uh, work and are funded, and, 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 and I think we made a mistake. And I, f I found fascinating the way that our allies basically let us know that. Um, it is also an example of what could be done with China. I think, as I said earlier, I think the Chinese relationship is a complicated one because we, we have a lot that we have in common that we want to do together. There are, uh, but there is competitiveness. What is true given politics both here and in China, there are those who um, have a stake in making sure that their, uh, the military budget goes up. Uh, and so I think there really is kind of a sense of uh, threat and, <clears throat> you know, are we containing China or is China pushing out? Uh, China is definitely pushing out uh, in a variety of different ways and the question is how to react to it. And, <clears throat> uh, and so what we have to be nimble about is to try to figure out what are the issues that we can cooperate on <clears throat> and what we have to compete on. But I go back to saying and I, I think this needs to be examined more. We need each other and trying to figure out how um, being, again, indispensable does not mean alone. And the system, <clears throat> what is going on in the world is so complicated that it needs to have the partnership of major countries. And so I see the U.S.-Chinese relationship as one <clears throat> which is codependent of trying to solve problems together uh, while recognizing the politics of what is going on. Iraq. Uh, if I were Jeb Bush, I would have known how to answer that <coughs> question. Um, uh, I have believed that Iraq is the biggest disaster in American history. Uh, it has ruined America's reputation, uh, I, or damaged it, because our reputation can be uh, reversed quickly um, and has been in many ways. <clears throat> it, uh, I am chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute. What it did was militarize democracy and make it very hard. Uh, and I think it has put us in a very bad position in the Middle East on all the issues that we've discussed. Uh, <clears throat> I think that there are slow movement that is improving in terms of trying to get more inclusive government, uh, trying to figure out whether there is such a way, the United States is based on a federal system, uh, whether there is some way to try to figure out how the various parts of Iraq can be brought together, um, and um, how the ground, that we don't have to do everything. 
Um, I think the, the real problem is what has happened in terms of the balance of the Middle East uh, and the fact that Iraq is not a balance to Iran or among the different other issues. But Henri, I don't know. I mean, when you're here, we need to, I, th I think that this is a question. Uh, we, um, what I, I remember, I, I have worked for every losing Democratic presidential candidate. And when Michael Dukakis, if you remember him, uh, <coughs> was running, one of the things that he kept saying <coughs> was just think how cynical uh, the P5 are. Bo all members of the P5 have contributed troops to both sides of the Iran-Iraq war. Um, and, and I think that we never fully understood all the balancing aspects of it. Right. And I think that going into Iraq, God knows why, um, has kind of disturbed all of it and we haven't put it back together. And I think it's going to need an awful lot of thinking from, to go back to Bruce's question, of scholars and practitioners uh, doing stuff together. Right. I really do think. And because I don't think there is a good answer at the moment. And then all the questions that we had on the Middle East, starting with you, Jane, um, in terms of, right. I don't think we have answers, which leads me back to, which I'll leave people with, I think we are in an entirely different kind of period. And um, I stole this statement from somebody, so I, uh, I can't remember who, so I can't credit it exactly, but it works perfectly for what's going on. People are talking to their governments on 21st century technology. Governments hear them on 20th century technology and are providing 19th century responses. So there is no faith in institutions, whether they are um, national or international. And I think we have a responsibility to go back and question assumptions and try to figure out what the system is that has non-state actors in it that keep changing their loyalties and where religion and culture um, and proximity and cyber and all kinds of new things are taking place. And so those of us that have been at this at a long time have to kind of get our brains around all that. Well, Madam Secretary, that was absolutely brilliant. And uh, on behalf of all the scholars and program directors and supporters of the Wilson Center, thank you thank for you. opening thank this you. day. Thank you very much.